Good day, Las Vegas, and welcome back to Vegas Vibes, giving you a peek at what's grooving and brewing in the music pageantry, live production, and fascinating scenes in the city that never sleeps. And I'm your host, Esmeralda Padilla Gold. This episode is special. We call it Vegas Vibes on the Road. Why? Because I am shooting outside the studio. And I'm interviewing someone from Hollywood who's here in the entertainment capital of the world, not to play, but to work. He's a multi-awarded screenwriter, producer, and director from Australia. And I can't wait to share with you my epic interview with Mr. Mark Savage. So don't go away, folks, because Vegas Vibes on the Road will be right back. Thanks for staying with me. I would like to thank the avid viewers of Vegas Vibes on Vegas Live TV, ACTV, WCTV, Pitch Networks.tv, especially those watching on my favorite devices, Roku, Kodi, Amazon, Fire TV, and of course, in my very own website, VegasVibes.us. Please continue to watch my show and tell your friends to support Vegas Vibes on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. The biggest entertainment news this week is my special guest, Mr. Mark Savage. Welcome back to Vegas Vibes on Vegas Vibes. I feature amazingly talented people from many walks of life who contribute to making Las Vegas a unique global brand. And on that note, here with us today is a multi-award winning screenwriter, television director, and film producer. Some of his achievements include Sensitive New Age Killer, Stress to Kill, Purgatory Road, and his latest work in 2020, Pain Killer. He is greatly known for his integrity and professionalism among people he has worked with. Always serious about his craft in creating quality and interesting horror films and when it comes to getting things done. He leaves no doubt he is one of the most skilled and among the best in the business. Originally from Australia and currently residing in California, USA, I'm so pleased to have on Vegas Vice, Mr. Mark Savage. Hello! Hi, Esmeralda. It's such a... A pleasure to be here and um, after that introduction, um, I'm sort of speechless. I'm actually getting emotional <laughs> reading your intro and actually I just did this one last night. After watching your Purgatory uh, Road, I, I, have, I must say that it was well made. Thank you. And I am very curious, what was the catalyst that brought you to this way of living? Did you have a horrible life growing up? <laughs> Or, um, please tell us. I'm, I'm probably going to disappoint you that my life growing up was not too horrible. Um, I definitely had difficulties growing up, but the main difficulties were associated with my eyesight. Um, I wore an eye patch from the age of four until the age of ten. Uh, big black glasses with a giant eye patch. I look a little like a pirate. Oh. And. I guess at a very early age, I felt very self-conscious, uh, a little bit like a monster, but I saw a horror film at a very early age. Actually, it was Frankenstein. And I figured, that's kind of like me. And rather than seeing that as a bad thing, I saw it as a good thing. And I had a little bit of, um, probably got a lot of, when I was younger, quite a bit of bullying at school. And it was mainly just because I was different. Um, so I'd say that I overcame being different by focusing my attention on, um, you know, stories, you know, storytelling. And, you know, I wrote little stories when I was a kid, you know, horror stories. And I think it sort of helped me deal with my own uh, difficulties, you know, my own personal difficulties until eventually, I, I guess, by making horror films and orchestrating ho some horrible things, you know, sometimes like, you know, violence and murders and that type of thing, by taking some control of it, um, you then feel, I, I think, that you have you, that you have more, more of a say over your destiny when you're able to control the elements that used to be part of your life that were troubling to you. Forgive me for saying horrible 
life growing <laughs> no. up. It was supposed, it no, was no, meant I'm, to be uh, a comedy thing. It's a legitimate <laughs> question. Uh, it's a legitimate question. I'm a That's frustrated fine. comedian like <laughs> the guy over there, Mr. T.J. <laughs> Smart. A little, little shout out. Well, um, so I, I understand that your brother also is an actor. Yeah. So um, is the, does uh, arts and entertainment run in your family? doesn't really run in the family. Uh, my parents were not involved in the arts. My, I mean, my mum was very encouraging, though, um, of my writing. You know, I wrote from a very early age. I got a typewriter at a very young age, and I also learned to handwrite very young to the point that I did so much writing as a kid that I actually um, bent my finger. And this was from a very early age that I, I, I would write so long and and so arduously as a kid that it yeah, bent my finger. But my brother... How did you bend your finger? Well, I, I used to write so much oh. when, my, when I was so young and my um, fingers were still forming when I was very young that it literally bent my finger. And I remember at one point my mum said, the doctor said, you've got to stop holding the pen so hard and writing so much because I would spend sometimes four or five hours on a Saturday morning just writing my, my own little books as a kid. So I was very very, very determined to be involved in storytelling. And my brother, when I first started making movies, the first movies I made were on a format called Super 8, which is really not a format that's particularly um, popular anymore. But it was like, um, he was the only person I could cast in my movies. So sometimes he played three or four characters. You How know. convenient, can you be my brother as well? <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, sometimes he would even kill himself. You know, so sometimes he'd play a particular character chasing someone in the woods who was also played by him. And then he would then, when he got stabbed, it would be my hand stabbing while I'm holding the camera and he would be stabbing himself playing another character. So we spent a lot of time making the early movies uh, together and he's only two years younger than me. So um, until I started to b make films professionally, um, that was really when we took slightly different paths, like career paths. And I pretty much, you know, went into, you know, movie making, making movies, producing movies, directing movies. And he took a different path. He went more into the academic side of filmmaking. It takes quite an imagination to write a horror film. What's the thought process? Like, how do you pre prepare to create in creating a movie? Well, I think everything that I'm interested in is, comes from my own interest in human behavior. And I think human beings are the most inconsistent creatures on earth. I think probably everyone would agree with that. Um, there's nothing more inconsistent than a human being. Um, dogs, cats, you know, different animals are very consistent. You know, like you can rely on them to do certain things. It's not that way with human beings. They're a lot more complex. So I've always been super interested in human behavior. So horror to me, and the genre that's called horror, encompasses dealing with fears, dealing with anxieties, and often you even may have an anxiety that's being dealt with in a drama that the same anxiety can be dealt with in a horror movie, but it's dealt with just in a, it's almost like it's dealt with through a different type of frame. I'd say that the films I'm interested in, like for example, Purgatory Road, which was the second last film that I made, I grew up Catholic and I had a lot of church going, too much. <laughs> Six days a week sometimes I'd go to church. Oh, wow. So I went to a Catholic boys school and we, we had church every day, and then on Sunday, my parents would drag me to church, or Saturday night. Sometimes we go Saturday night because my dad knew the service was fast. He'd then get home to watch the football when he, um, after the fast church service. But, you know, uh, being Catholic, um, I wanted to make a film about religious fanaticism, which is what Purgatory Road's about, because I'm interested in the idea that someone can have a belief, and even if the belief is wrong, if someone believes something enough, and even if it's a false belief, you know, the consequences of that is that they could kill someone. You know, that, so it's about someone who believes that he's, he's taking care of sinners by killing them before they sin again. He's not doing it because he's enjoying the killing. He literally feels that I'm going to help the world and I'm also going to help these people. They won't sin again a particular sin that's revealed in the movie that you know what that sin is, they're not going to sin again if I kill them before they do it again. And, but he, and he sincerely believes it. And that type of psychosis to me is very interesting because it, it controls your entire life. So your entire life can sometimes be controlled by something that's actually 
either untrue or that is a delusion. And that to me is what's so interesting about drama is you, you're, you're focusing on the foibles of human behavior. To what extent did you go to when you were uh, creating Purgatory Road? Did you actually study human behavior? Did you talk to a criminal person? I'm very interested in uh, the psychology. I studied psychology at, at college, so um, I have a degree in that. And I, I find one of the most difficult aspects, I think, of being human is that we're encouraged to be ourselves, right? But should you encourage someone who's a serial killer to be themselves? And so there's often like a division there that we're encouraged to live, you know, true to our nature. And I think it is some people, their true nature is to kill or to deal with problems by killing. That's natural to them. It's not necessarily something that's outside the realm. And, 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 and it's a lot more complex how they get to that point because I don't think, I don't personally believe that a serial killer is born. But at the same time, I don't necessarily believe that someone is born good or bad. I think they're simply born, I mean, everything is simply, it's, it's an action. If some, like a, a child, when a child throws sand in another child's face, they're not doing it to be evil. They're doing it either angrily or they're simply just doing it because it's something that they're doing as a reaction to something else, but they're not making a judgment on whether that is a good or a bad thing when you're that young. That's why you need parents to tell you, that's not good. <laughs> Don't throw sand in that person's face. You know, um, do this instead. Or, or if you're angry with that person, tell them you're angry or, or whatever. But the way that we deal with things often comes from parenting and the way we're raised. But I think it all comes back to, to me, what's called horror is really just a broader examination of fears. I don't really set out in a horror film, actually, I really don't set out to go, I want people to jump and be scared. It just so happens that those films fall into that category because I don't really make films that you would call jump scare films where they're just about every five minutes you'd like jumping like that. No, it, it's more like I like to take people into the sort of darkness because I think also in order to understand good, you need to understand bad, just in the same way you can't appreciate the, the daylight unless you know what it's like to be, to walk at night. Please hold that thought. We're going to queue for a commercial. We'll be right back, so don't go away. Welcome back to Vegas Vice. We're still here with the famous director, Mr. Mark Savage. Before we queue up for commercial, I've, I think, uh, where were we? We were asking you now. Yeah, you, were, you were asking me about um, like where, where it comes from, the idea of the interest in horror and in, in dealing with fear. Um, so I was just essentially elaborating on that. You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, and good parenting is very important. Well, I, I mean, I, I think good parenting is always, is always important because, that's, because it's our parents that sort of help us to understand, to, to, they help us establish our, our moral core because you don't just do it naturally. You know, you do need someone to shape, to shape that. You know, it's like, you know, you're very pliable when you're younger and it's also how, you know, children, you know, get it, like either neglect or abuse or whatever. Like, um, it, it has consequences, but also, treating children in a positive way that that's that's a consequence that that's a good consequences and most horror is about people who at some point probably didn't get parented very well speaking of that did you have a mentor or someone who has guided and shaped you to the person you are today I wish I did <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what person I am today I had someone who was a filmmaker in Australia his name is Richard Franklin he was someone at least who at a very early age, because the first few films I made in Australia, it's, it's a little bit different to the US. A lot of horror films and films that were dealing with darkness weren't that common. 
So when I would make them and even screen them as a kid, as a teenager, people would often laugh and say, oh, why are you wasting your time making this rubbish? So you've yeah, got how do you keep your sanity? Yeah, no, that's a harder thing um, because, and it's one of the hardest things, I think, even as a teenager, um, to be able to own and feel confident in what you're doing because that's a period when you're very vulnerable and you're easily influenced and you're also very easily hurt by criticism. Um, it's very hard to get to a point where you sort of go, people will either love you or they will hate you. Like, that just doesn't happen yeah, automatically as a teenager. You know what I mean? From like, even throw it back at you. I mean, how confident were you as a teenager? Mm, not very confident. So what do you think gave you your confidence? Uh, Self-care. I just have to realize it. Self-awareness. And yeah. not letting anything discourage me from pursuing what I love. Yeah, so you had an inner strength. That, like, and I think, in, in a sense, that to be able to get to that point where you feel confident enough to say, this is what I do, uh, I'm going to do it as best I can, and also to respect what you're doing. Because when people would say to me, you know, why do you make, you know, why do you make those kind of films, all those kind of rubbish? Well, number one, usually the people who said that hadn't seen any of the best films in that genre. So they were very, you know, so they would say, oh, those kind of films are terrible. Well, that's because they'd never seen the good ones. It's understandable. It's like, it's like if you meet someone and this is, you know, it's even like, how racism begins. Someone meets one person from a particular race that has a bad experience and then they say, oh, I don't like those kind of people. Well, you've met one person. There's 10 million of those people. Let's meet a few more before you make your decision. It's the same thing often when someone is um, you know, critical of a particular form of art, a particular genre of movie. They'll say, oh, I don't like that. You're wasting your time. I grew up essentially with parents telling me, you know how to write. You know, they, they encouraged me in my writing, but they at the same time said, but don't waste it making stuff rubbish like that. You should get a job as a journalist. That's what they said to me. And I said, no, I'm going to make horror films. And they said, there's no way anyone could make a living making horror films. <laughs> and for a while they were right. You know, like for, because for a while, it took me a long time to get to a point where I actually could say, quite honestly, I'm making a pretty decent living making movies. That's probably, I don't know, like 15, 20 years to get to that point, you know, also going through, you know, a couple of wives who gave up on me as well. <laughs> and, you know, because it's an up and down life. So are you saying you're single right now? I am now. Um, but, you know, going, going up and down, it's, it's, not, it's not a field that also, it's not the kind of field that most parents even encourage their children to get into because it's difficult, you know, and eventually you get to a point, and so it's very hard to find people to surround yourself, and you've got to surround yourself in a sense with misfits with people who don't pretty much toe the regular line and so then understand that it is an up and down kind of life, especially at the beginning, because you know the first few films that I made, I financed them myself. I worked at McDonald's. McDonald's financed my first movies because I, I had a part-time wow. job as a teenager and the first, say, 50 films I made, like short films, I flipped hamburgers, <laughs> you know, cooked wow, french interesting. fries. interesting. I would never imagine that. Yeah, at McDonald's. So. I had a part-time job and that was how I did because I knew no one was going to give me money and trust me until I could show them something that would have a professional level. You know, you can't expect that. And the only thing that makes it slightly easier now, and it's only slightly, it, it's not like people throw money at you, it doesn't work like that, um, is that at least now I can say to people, oh, have a look at this, this and this. In the early days, it's like, oh, I hope they don't look at this. <laughs> You know, or only look at five minutes of this because the rest is terrible or I don't, or the acting wasn't good. I mean, the first film I ever made, and it's my fault, um, it's got three terrible performances in it. I mean, some are okay, but three are awful because at that time, I'd hire people I knew and I hadn't learnt that you don't hire people who are your friends and put them in key roles unless they're really good. You don't hire them just because they're available. But... When you're starting out, you know, you have a different mindset. You just want to get something done. And eventually you get to a point where you also understand how important it is to do things professionally. But also to me, in scripting, the most important thing to me is that you have strong characters who want something, other characters who want to stop them from doing something. And you've got to work on the characters first before you do anything. And then you work on the structure. And it doesn't matter what kind of film it is. There's no film that doesn't deserve 100% commitment and every film can, like, because every idea can either be made into a great film or it can be killed in the process of imagining the film. You can come up with it and say, oh, I've got this great idea, because I get this all the time. People saying, I've got this really interesting idea. I always say to them, that's just an idea. That's a scene. That's not a film. 
Write it into a script, then I'll, because they go, do, do you want to hear about my idea? I go, no, no, write it down. Because if you can't write it down and articulate it in writing, I don't want to hear it. I know this is your life, but is there anything that you would like to pursue outside filmmaking? That's a good question. <laughs> you, you've stumped me there. Look, I think I'm pursuing what I, I, I like to do that I, do, I really just want to keep making films for the rest of my life. I, I, I mean, I n would never stop. I mean, I'll stop when I'm dead. And I would simply say, you know, I mean, because the only other thing I'm interested in is psychology, you know, and I've always been interested in that and probably hadn't making films, I'd be working, working in that. But no, um, the, the, the thing with filmmaking, like when you're directing, producing movies, the only thing that could change is that I could get bigger budgets. But I really don't focus on getting budgets that are too big because I don't want to lose control over making the movie. Now, because there's a certain point when at a certain budget level, it's not really just your own movie anymore. And I'm not saying that it's not already collaborative, because it is. I collaborate with people. I'm not like I'm the director, but I bring in amazingly talented people. And you pick really good people. You don't teach them how to do it because you're picking people who know how to do it and you collaborate. And all I want to do is continue to make movies with people who I respect and just explore different ideas. I mean, I don't just do horror like the one I just did is a crime thriller. I also have a, a children's movie about soccer, about girls soccer team that I also want to do at the moment as well. I've got a lot of interest in it. And I have another one that's a sort of like um, about a little a tiny little girl who basically has a crisis of faith and begins killing people thinking she's doing something right for God. And so I, I just want to really keep exploring different movies, working with talented people, and hopefully for everybody is able to bring out their best from wardrobe to makeup to cinematography. And because my background is also shooting, so I also shoot as well and I do a bit of cutting. But most of the time now, I've got people and we all work together collaboratively. So all I would say, I never want to stop doing it. And it's never, I mean, there's parts of it that are not fun. The business side's not fun. I don't enjoy, I raise finance, but at the same time, I don't enjoy the paperwork, but I don't think anyone enjoys the paperwork. I mean, maybe a few people out there have a paperwork fetish and that's fine. You know, if they're, <laughs> if they're getting off on paperwork, great. That's, they, they, I need to work with them. They can do my paperwork because, um, but these are the things you, that you need to accept when you're being creative. It's not all Disneyland. There's a part of it that you need to be responsible to investors because they are investing their hard-earned money into your movie. So you need to be responsible to investors. You also basically also need to be responsible when you're making the movie. Your obligation is to the script. It's not to, um, it's not to yourself, it's to the script. What kind of legacy would you want to leave behind? How, how would you like to be remembered in this lifetime? Have you found your purpose? I know this is your passion. Have you found your, do you already know what your mission in life is? That's another good question. Your questions, you're asking really, really deep and um, provocative questions. Look, I really like enabling other people. I really enjoy that. I really like, because the collaborative aspect of filmmaking is so fantastic that it's like a drug. You know, that I'm depressed and even the people who I work with are often depressed immediately after the shoot, you know, because you're all working together so hard. It's very concentrated too, because when you're making a movie, you may, for example, shoot it for four to six weeks. You've also had pre-production, but it's almost like opening a, a, a regular company might run for two years and close. A film is like a company that runs for three months and closes, but it's just as intense. Think of that two years of intensity compressed into three months. So that's why when it ends, it's, there's a certain element of, of loss, almost grief about saying goodbye to the people. So to me, I would say, look, to me, whatever the legacy is in terms of my movies, that's up to other people to decide because I can't make people like my movies or dislike my movies. I mean, that's, once it's out there, it's out there. But I'd say- Well, I love your movies. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. But I would say if there's any legacy for me, it's just that I helped other people um, realize their own, um, talents and, uh, and help them enable their talents to um, by working with me on the films um, that hopefully I gave them a forum and I gave them a opportunity 
to be their best because I really enjoy that. In the same way I enjoy, I love suggesting films to people. I'll say, and I'm, I'm genuinely love recommending films to people. Um, and, I, and I don't mean my own films. I mean, I'm constantly recommending films because I like to share my own passion and the films that, for example, impacted me. Um, I'll always recommend it to other people. But of course, I also know that everyone synthesizes films differently and everyone's own history is the deciding factor in why they like a film or not. You know, I can watch a film and go, oh, I love that movie. You could watch it and say, I didn't, I didn't get it. It didn't resonate with me at all because we're all bringing our histories to art. So every time we look at a piece of art, we're looking at it through very individual eyes, which is why someone, one person will say, I think it's crap. Another person will say, that's a masterpiece. And I think that's the greatest thing about art and being part of making art. And, and, and I mean, I'm not deluded saying I make amazing art, but it is still art. And the commercial aspect is simply something that you've got to deal with, but that doesn't take away the fact that you need to make stuff that's, I feel, that's really aesthetically strong. I'm obsessive about getting the focus right, the lighting right, the music perfect, working with the composers and all that. And to me, hopefully, at least the legacy is I cared because I, I really don't want to make anything I don't care about. Like anything that gets offered to me that I'm, I don't care about, I don't want to do it. Because you don't do it for money, you do it for passion. Yeah, because I mean, at a certain point, you know, everyone needs to survive. And, I, and, I've, I've, and I've been through that period where I, I need to survive. But there's also a point when you sort of go, I don't want to, I don't want to waste weeks, months or years of my life doing something just for the money because you then get to a point, you then get to a point that your heart's not in it. So if your heart's not in it, how can you expect the audience to care about it if you didn't care about it? Yeah, that's not the way to capture people's heart. Exactly, exactly. I wish we had more time, but for my final question, what uh, words of advice or words of wisdom could you suggest to anyone who would like to be a world-renowned director like you? Let me think again. I mean. I would say understand only do it if you feel like there is nothing else you want to do. Only do it if you feel a burning desire to do it, but that burning desire must not be about thinking I'm going to get rich doing it. No, do it because you, you legitimately feel like you really want to tell stories. It legitimately excites you to go to work. Then by all means do it because it's so hard to do it that focusing on something like, oh, I'm going to do it to make a lot of money, you could actually make quicker money doing other things than making movies. And especially on a long-term basis because getting to a point where you're producing and directing and writing, that it really does take years to do it. And the other thing is with script writing, I'm, all, I'm forever a student. I'm never at a point when I go, oh, I'm a great writer. No, it's a I'm constant always a student. Yeah, it's a constant learning, right? Um, the same with what you're doing. You know, it's, you're always learning and you change as you learned and the journey is really the thing. So if you really believe that the journey is more exciting in a sense than the destination, then you've probably picked the right thing to do. Please invite everyone, our global audience, where could they find you? Oh, um, I, have, I have films on, uh, on Amazon, a couple on Netflix, on 2B TV, uh, and on Blu-ray, DVD. Um, you yeah, just can look up some of the titles or can also look up, say, IMDb. Under my name, we'll have some of the films listed. And I, my next film's coming out, actually, on May the 4th. That's Painkiller. Pain yeah. I'm excited to yeah, watch that. Thank you. Well, I would like to say it's truly an honor and privilege to have you on Vegas Vibes and my heartfelt gratitude for being here today. Well, thank you so much. And it's an honor and, pr and privilege to actually meet you and um, appear in this amazing show. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best in your current and future endeavors. Thank you so much. I extend that to you also. Thank you so thank much, you. Mr. Mark Savage. Thank well, you, Esmeralda. Catch me again next week as I feature another amazing personality here on Vegas Vibes. <laughs> I wish we had more time. 
hope you enjoyed this week's episode as much as I did sharing the vibes of Vegas. And time really flies when you're having a grand time. Promise to join me again next week on the same Vegas Vibes channel. And to all our global viewers out there, let me remind you that Las Vegas is not just about the world-renowned strip or the famous Fremont Street experience in the vibrant downtown district. It has real people, a lot of them musicians, live entertainers, and those involved in the world of pageantry, and to the people here in the Valley who work hard each day to make Las Vegas a global brand. I would like to feature you and your cool story right here on Vegas Vibes, either at your workplace or at the studio. Please email me now at vegasvibes1 at gmail.com. Before I go, I would like to thank my order sponsor, Anne Fontaine, located at the Forum Shops of Caesars Palace. Anne Fontaine is now open for business as well. You may call Miss Anna Billings at 702-733-6205 to make your appointment. And finally, my favorite segment, the Vegas Vibes Closet. It features an intricate selection of health and beauty products which I personally use. And this week I have for you Clinic Pop Lip Color Primer in Color 12 Fab Pop. It is a rich color plus a smoothing primer in one that keeps lips comfortably moisturized. This luxurious yet weightless formula merges bold, saturated color with a smoothing primer. It glides on effortlessly to a modern velvet finish. The color stays true and keeps lips comfortably moisturized. The Color Pop line by Clinique is one of my favorite lipsticks. It does not dry my lips out and this color goes with everything. Check it out ladies! Below is the evil link if you wish to learn more about it or purchase it without any delay. Follow Vegas Vibes on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and check out Vegas Vibes for updates and announcements. Once again, I'm your host, Esmeralda Padilla Gold. Thank you for watching. Ma. <laughs>